15. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, I've been asked to talk about, talk about Brexit, and I imagine, given that this is in Notting Hill, there are probably almost as many people here against Brexit as there are against factory farming and uh, against uh, sex discrimination in favor of democracy. So I, I imagine most of you will be on, on my side of the debate, and therefore what I'm going to structure it uh, as is three points. Firstly, what's wrong, some of the things that are wrong with Brexit that even you may not really know about yet. Secondly, why despite that Brexit appears to be inevitable. And thirdly, what could yet happen in the next six to nine months that would stop it. So let me start with uh, what is wrong with Brexit that you may not uh, be aware of. Uh, well, firstly, uh, as, as we like to tell stories in, the, in these things, oh, sorry, that, wasn't, that was supposed to come up in a minute, but I'll come to that. Uh, I was actually going to start with a more personal, subjective view. As you can probably tell from my name, uh, I didn't come to Britain with the Norman Conquest, and neither did my family. Uh, I, in fact, had four passports by the time I was 19, and therefore I'm quintessentially a citizen of the world, and therefore, according to our Prime Minister's official post-Brexit post rhetoric, if you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere who does not even understand the word citizenship, at least in the context of Britain. Now, as a person who's lived here for 50 years and who chose it consciously as my home when my parents moved to America, and who's felt immensely privileged to bring up a family here in Notting Hill, the most excitingly cosmopolitan area of London, which is the most excitingly cosmopolitan city in Europe, which is the most excitingly cosmopolitan continent in the world, I found Brexit a shattering experience. And therefore, uh, with great regret, uh, I've just acquired Polish citizenship so as to remain a European. Now, who would have imagined before 2016 that anybody even vaguely intelligent and rational, which I consider myself to be, might consider a Polish passport to be more valuable than a British one? But that's where we are. But now for a more objective view, and that's where uh, this comes in. But even before this, I actually have, have a prop that I brought along with me. Today's Times, the front page of Today's Times, Brexit costs households 900 pounds a year, says, uh, Carney. Uh, I arranged with Mark Carney, my friend, to give that speech yesterday just so it could be on the front page of the Times. Now, isn't that just the discredited so-called project fear uh, that failed to win the voters over in the election? Well, actually, no, because project fear was not discredited. In fact, it was uncannily accurate, which is what this chart uh, is supposed to illustrate. This was the chart produced by the uh, Treasury in the month before the referendum to show what they would estimate would be the loss to the average British household of Brexit, or the worst case scenario of Brexit, so-called WTO membership, about 5,000 pounds a year, or seven or eight percent of the GDP. Now, was that discredited, 5,000 pounds a year, when this said over only 900? Not at all. If you look at the, end of it, at the top of it, that was over a period of 15 years. So, if you think about a loss of 8% of GDP over 15 years is equal to how much per year? About half a percent a year. That, as Mark Carney said yesterday, is exactly what has already been lost in the last two years of, of, of post-Brexit referendum. Half percent each, 1% over two years, which is what 900 pounds of household comes to. In other words, the project fear projections have proved uncannily accurate so far, and that's even before Brexit has happened. Now I'll give you a simple and quick explanation of why this has happened before moving on to the next part of why, despite this, it seems inevitable. Uh, why this has happened is really explained in the next three slides that I'm going to show. This shows GDP per head, which is roughly, which is the best uh, indicator of living standards in a nation or productivity in a nation over a long period for all the six, the six biggest advanced economies in the world. And as you can see, the UK, and this is over the last 25 years, since 1993, the 25 years from 93 to 2007, Britain was actually the best performing economy in the world. Better than the United States, better than Germany, far better than France, Japan, or Italy. 
Why 1993? It was 25 years, a convenient period, but much more significantly, 1993 was the beginning of a golden age for the British economy for two reasons, two things that happened at the end of 1992. First was so, the so-called so Black Wednesday incident, when Britain for the first time broke out of any kind of link with the US dollar, the Deutschmark, the gold standard, and began to operate its own independent monetary policy, a privilege that was denied to other European Union members who all joined the euro, which was a big mistake, as I anticipated at the time in, in, in the, my columns in the Times. And incidentally, among the greatest proponents of Britain staying in the euro, or be, being part of the euro, being part of the Deutschmark, were Norman Lamont and Nigel Lawson, two of the great uh, advocates of Brexit today. Uh, so talk about wrong then, wrong, uh, wrong now. They were the people who were wrong then, wrong now. The other thing that happened in January 93 was the completion of the single market program. Now the single market program was designed by Margaret Thatcher to change the European Union into an organization that served Britain's interests as opposed to German or French interests because Britain was a producer and an exporter of financial services, business services, architecture, art and so on, other service industries which were not covered by the common market before 1993. So from 1993 onwards, Britain had a unique advantage within the EU of benefiting from the single market program designed by Margaret Thatcher for Britain's interests, but not suffering from the downside of being locked into the euro. In other words, Britain was actually able to have its cake and eat it for that 25 years. And that cake has now been thrown away. Now to see what impact that cake is likely to be, uh, have, uh, throwing away that cake is likely to, to, to have, Look at these other next two charts. So this is 93 to 2000. Look again at the blue line. Britain, before it joined the common market in 1975, it was the sick man of Europe, by far the worst performing economy in, in, in Europe before it joined the common market. And then in the period between 75 and 93, when it was in the common market, but before the single, between, uh, before the single market, it sort of roughly performed on average in line with the rest of the EU. So what that history suggests, it doesn't prove it of course, but what it suggests is that I say Britain was a unique beneficiary of the EU as it was set up before of the cake that we were eating and having and have now thrown away. Now why did voters ignore this evidence? Well partly it's because of the pathetic Remain campaign and especially Cameron's unwillingness to take on Boris Johnson, Gove and Farage in that campaign because he was so complacent. It was also because what I think was the BBC's shameful confusion of honest and uh, objective reporting with so-called impartiality, which means giving equal time to people who say the earth is flat, which is exactly what they did in the referendum campaign. But also it's because most voters actually did follow their economic interests, but those who wanted Britain to prosper were overwhelmed by those who really didn't care, very much along the lines that David Runciman was uh, talking about. What do I mean by that? Well, young people voted overwhelmingly against Brexit by three to one among the under, uh, under 25s and almost two to one among all people under 45. And so did voters who were in the workforce, who were actually working or looking for jobs, and were thus, therefore sensitive to the economy. Brexit only won because of retired people, the unemployed, and other non-workers who aren't affected by economic performance and who voted about 60-40 for Brexit. In fact, if you think about it, pensioners who are con uh, protected by Index-linked pensions, the so-called triple lock, which guarantees their pensions go up every year regardless of what happens to the economy, are in relative terms actually better off when the British economy declines. The main motivation for these old people for voting for Brexit was nostalgia for a sort of prelapsarian golden age before the social revolutions of the 1970s. And that's really what old voters really meant when they said, I want my country back. The strongest predictor of Brexit voting in every demographic group was in fact not even education, uh, as David suggested, it was the attitude to capital punishment and other cultural issues like gay marriage and feminism. 
Those who were in favor of capital punishment against gay marriage overwhelmingly voted for Brexit and vice versa. What about anti-immigrant feeling? Wasn't that really the driving force? Well, actually it wasn't. Although Leave voters opposed in principle the principle of multiculturalism when asked by about three to one, their practical attitudes to immigration are actually much more liberal throughout the country than Theresa May's, for example. Uh, YouGov has polled many thousands of voters for anti-Brexit organizations that I've been involved in, asking this question. Should Britain offer EU citizens the right to travel, work, study, or retire in Britain if British citizens are given the same rights in the EU. On average, in all these polls, 62% of the population say yes, and that includes 42% of Leave voters. Now, dozens of these polls have now been conducted involving tens of thousands of voters, and they've always yielded the same result. Free movement actually has a clear majority. It's only when you put immigration in the context of I want my country back or take back control that it gets a majority. So what is it really that has made Brexit seem unstoppable, given that there aren't really any strong arguments for it? And I think the main reason is simply politics. Neither politicians nor the media in Britain seem to care any longer about what is best for the country. Politics now concentrates entirely on what's best for the Tories or best for Labour or best for Theresa May or Boris Johnson or Jacob rees mogg and that's why the anti-Brexit organization that I helped to uh, create was named after a lot of market research and polling, Best for Britain, and why our campaign in the 2017 election to encourage tactical voting played a small but significant part in denying a mandate for Theresa May's extreme Brexit. It's also perhaps why an absence of any association with political parties or political leaders, either past, present, or future, on which we decided, has paradoxically helped Best for Britain attract sufficient funding to become the main funder of all the other anti-Brexit groups. But this leads me to the central paradox of trying to stop Brexit. There are probably enough MPs who actually do care about what's best for Britain and know that Brexit is profoundly against Britain's natural, uh, national interest to stop the process. But they won't defy their party leaders unless they feel some kind of backing from voters. And this creates a chicken and egg problem. Politicians will only move against Brexit if and when they feel a change in public opinion. But public opinion will only change if it feels a change in political leadership. Now, the first part of that paradox is obvious. Politicians are there to please voters. But what about the second? Why haven't voters changed, begun to change their minds uh, about Brexit as they watch the slow motion train uh, crash that is being performed before us? I think there are four main reasons for this. First, there's a fake respect for democracy. We're told the people have spoken, and anyone who opposes the will of the people is a traitor or a saboteur. Now, why is this a false respect for democracy? Well, anyone with a sense of uh, knowledge of history will know that the will of the people is an even more ominous uh, slogan than citizens of nowhere. In fact, opposing a referendum decision is no more anti-democratic than opposing a government that's been elected with majority support, but nevertheless trying to de defeat them in the next election. The freedom to oppose majority decisions, far from being anti-democratic, is actually the very essence of our democracy. What is genuinely anti-democratic is the slogan of dictators from Robespierre to Mussolini to Kim Jong-un, one man, one vote, one time. Or as David Davis uh, actually observed with unusual eloquence a few years ago, a democracy that cannot change its mind is not a democracy. So that leads me to the second uh, possibility. Assuming that most voters, unlike uh, John Humphreys and other presenters of the Today program, are not so stupid as to confuse democracy with majoritarianism, what is it that's preventing some kind of public uh, backlash against the Brexit? Well, political consultants tell us that voters don't like to change their minds. Even when conditions change, 
people don't like to admit their errors. But I don't find that at all con uh, convincing because, after all, incompetent governments are booted out all the time. So let's move on to a third related explanation for why there hasn't been a change in public opinion. The referendum was a traumatic experience, not only for Remainers, but for Leavers too. It divided friends and families, setting children against their parents and grandchildren. Most people simply don't want to repeat that agony. And in addition to the emotional opposition to revisiting the referendum, there's also a principled, or at least an apparent principled, objection. The referendum was obviously the wrong way to decide a complex issue like EU membership. It therefore seems superficially logical that holding a second referendum would be doubly stupid and wrong. And yet respect for democracy also seems to imply that a referendum decision can't be reversed without another referendum. So here we have another chicken and egg problem. It was wrong and stupid to hold the 2016 referendum, but in that case, holding a second referendum would be even more wrong and stupid. Yet you can't undo a referendum without a referendum, and therefore we're stuck. Which brings me to the last and I think most important impediment to any change in public opinion, and then I'll get to what actually still could change. That impediment is that if there's no acceptable way of reversing a referendum decision, Brexit becomes inevitable. Even if it's bad, even if it's wrong, it's inevitable. And if something is inevitable, why bother to question it? Why bother to think again? Stiff upper lip Britons say, keep calm and carry on and put up with it, however bad and stupid it is. All of us in the anti-Brexit movements have spent the past two years puzzling over these paradoxes, but a Gordian knot resolution now seems increasingly plausible. Britain, after all, is still a parliamentary democracy, and politicians will ultimately be judged on how they do affect the country's future, not just how they interpret a referendum which is receding into history and which most voters would actually rather forget. Which brings me to the final point, what could still happen to stop the Brexit juggernaut? Well, the full English Brexit uh, that was personally favored by Theresa May and other hardline nationalists came off the political menu when she lost her majority last June, and that was a big breakthrough. Since then, the most likely outcome has become some variant of what's called the Norway model a long, open-ended transition period during which very little changes in practice, but Britain formally gives up its EU membership and therefore loses its voting rights, becoming a rule taker instead of an important participant in framing EU law. Now, Norway joined the European Economic Area, the EEA, which you may have read about, along with Sweden and Finland in 1992 in what was intended at the time as a one-year transition period before deciding on EU membership. In Norway's case, that, transmission period, uh, that transition period is now in its 27th year. This is why I prefer to call the Norway model fake Brexit or perhaps better still, for those of you of roughly my age, Hotel California, you'll remember the Eagles song, you can check in, but you can't check out. And that's why Corbyn describes, quite rightly, I think, the EEA as a demotion for Britain from rule maker to rule taker, and why Jacob Rees-Mogg, for once say, uh, saying something accurately, calls EEA membership a reduction of Britain to a vassal state. That is what EEA membership would be. Uh, and that, I regret to say, that kind of fake Brexit, that endless transition, I regret to say is now the most likely outcome for Britain, and bizarrely the one favored by most business leaders. That's simply because all the other options are obviously even worse, since they'd involve Britain excluding itself completely from European markets and regulations, and yet and simultaneously developing purely British regulations on finance, medicine, food standards, agriculture, immigration, airline safety, and so on, and then having to align those standards with all the other regimes operating in the EU, the US, China, and elsewhere. Now, this kind of fake Brexit, this endless transition, would obviously be unsatisfactory for both Remainers and Leavers, even though it is the most likely outcome. 
Which brings me finally to a different alternative which is becoming more probable day by day. When Theresa May is forced to complete her Brexit uh, negotiations sometime this autumn and then present them to Parliament, it's increasingly probable that MPs could vote to reject her plan. Now, the government's position on that at the moment is that if, the Brex if Mrs. May's deal is rejected, that will simply mean a no-deal Brexit in March 2019. But the claim that no deal is the only alternative to a bad deal is obviously a bluff. If there's a parliamentary majority to vote down Mrs. May's deal, the same majority will be able to insist that the alternative to her unsatisfactory proposals is simply to stay in the EU rather than to crash out of it. Instead of May's absurd slogan that no deal is better than a bad deal, Parliament could easily decide that no Brexit is better than a bad Brexit. And if a parliamentary majority could coalesce to stop Brexit, then our MPs would almost certainly feel that a popular vote is needed to reverse the referendum of 2016. At this point, Labour would no doubt demand a general election, but the Tories would almost certainly opt for another referendum, which could probably be backed by the Scottish Nationalists and the Lib Dems. Either way, the odds of stopping Brexit would immensely increase. The key to whether the sequence of events actually happens will be the Labour Party and Corbyn. If Labour decides to vote against whatever deal Mrs May manages to stitch up by the autumn, it will only take a handful of Tory rebels to stop Brexit. If, on the other hand, Labour supports May's Brexit or abstains on it, which amounts to the same thing, then there would be no point in any Tory rebels defying their whips because in the absence of a unified opposition, the government would be guaranteed to win any parliamentary vote anyway. So the key to stopping Brexit over the next six months will be to pile pressure on MPs to vote against whatever deal Mrs May brings back to Parliament in the autumn. This pressure will be especially important in Labour-held marginal seats. And the most marginal seat in the country, as a result of Brexit, is right here in Kensington. So you have six months to make your votes count. Thank you very much.